welcome to another episode of the MMA Lock Cast. I'm your host, Manpreet, aka MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on social media at MMA LOTN. This week, we're going over the big UFC 282 card headline by a vacant light heavyweight title fight between former champion Jan Blachowicz and up and coming Dagestani killer Magomed Ankalaev in the May or co main event, which is really the only fight that's getting a lot of uh, publicity this week. We got Patty the Batty Pimblet going up against his toughest test to date and Jared Flash Gordon. So a very fun co-main event there. A couple other fun fights sprinkled out throughout the card, but obviously all eyes are going to be on the main event to see who will become the new light heavyweight champion. Will it be Blahovich regaining that title or will the Magomed Ankalaev era begin? I'm thinking more so the latter. But... Before we get into the breakdowns, the first thing I always love to do is Transparency 101. And, you know, things have been great since May, hitting almost every single week on a, you know, plus 40 to 50 unit run over the, those last several months. And everybody just enjoying the picks and bets that are coming out. But last week is a harsh reality that no matter how confident you feel on a side, you can still go out there and have a bad losing night. And not only did I have a losing night, I probably had, no, I did not probably, I had the worst betting night of the year and it came right in December so uh you know got to get it out hopefully we can get back on track this weekend but I'm not gonna shy away from it I'm not gonna uh just sweep it under the rug uh as most people will do I'm gonna face it like a man we had a horrible horrible event so let's start off with the lock of the night play which did not cash at all obviously Mark D. Casey was the first leg of that went out there and spoiled many parlays I'm sure but uh credit to Michael Johnson for anticipating the takedowns and then getting off on his own strikes so that he can go out there and get his hand raised via decision Mark D. Casey went out there and tried to wrestle as much as we thought he would but he couldn't even get close to sniffing a takedown once again credit to Michael Johnson bad bet on my part i'll fully own up to that the other leg of the parlay which is truly should have been the lock of the night play even at minus 500 was rafael dos Anjos going out there and making light work of brian barbarena's choking him out i believe it was in the second round but great work from him that was the guy that I was hoping to catch on this entire night. I just couldn't figure out the method of victory. If you guys read the uh, Action Network article that I put out, I actually put Dos Anjos by decision, but he ended up winning by submission. That was my hold up the entire time. I was more than happy to put five units down at minus 500 because I knew that Brian Barbarino was at a huge skill deficit in that matchup and it came to fruition. Let's keep going with the losses here. The other spot that I felt second most confident about was the under two and a half in the Darren Elkins and Jonathan and Pierce fight I got it at minus 132 hoping to win two two units but we end up minus 2.64 units on that bet what more can I say you know I mean he had a he had him in a bloody mess that entire fight uh you know I will never forget the fact that he tried to go out there and just have a highlight real performance the entire time trying to finish Darren Elkins with a front kick up the middle of that entire first round and he just blew away minutes that he could have been finishing him with uh, a proper combination if he put his punches together so minus 2.6 for units there not to mention Dan Mergliata Dan Mergliata sorry uh, fumbling the bag uh, right at the in, in the last round when Darren Elkins uh, gets taken down by Jonathan Pierce gets close to being put in the crucifix position where Jonathan Pierce likely could have gotten a finish but Mergliata stands them up to evaluate the cut that was on Darren Elkins and then restarted the fight with them both on the feet which ultimately was probably the nail in the coffin for us in terms of cashing that under two and a half so minus 2.64 units there minus 1.6 units on the over one and a half that I had in the Marcelo Rojo and Francis Marshall fight we were one minute away from cashing that bet but uh, Francis Marshall uncorks a huge bomb drops Marcelo Rojo and eventually finishes him in that fight too so good win for um for marshall uh you know getting his first win in the ufc over you know a solid opponent as well we'll see how many people continue to doubt him on his rise up the kid is still you know needs a little bit of work but he seems to have all the raw tools required to be a successful ufc fighter so i can't wait to see how he progresses throughout his ufc career uh minus one unit on the dog of the night player play on 
Gennaro Valdez, who, uh, you know, I knew it was going to ro- be a rocky start, but I thought he would really start to take over in the second and third rounds. That didn't really come to fruition. I expected Natan Levy to slow down even more than he did, uh, and that would allow Gennaro Valdez to stop the takedowns late in this fight, keep this fight standing, and then eventually finish him late. Did not come to fruition, minus one unit there. Uh, the hits keep on, came, uh, or the misses keep on coming, folks. Minus 1.51 units on Scott Holtzman at minus 151. Didn't really have him in uh, against Clay Guido, who just showed that he, you know, he can still go out there and do the damn thing. I really thought the athleticism and the power of Holtzman would be his key to victory here, but it seemed like he was really gassed out by the sixth minute of this fight, and we know what Clay Guido does against guys like that. He just runs them over, continues to just put the pressure on them, and run away with the fight, and that's exactly what happened in that fight. So, a bad bet there, all in all. It was a retirement fight for Scott Holtzman as well. Uh, Usually not a good sign. Uh, another bad bet <laughs> two units at minus 138 on nico price doesn't come to fruition i overlooked the technical uh, advantages that phil Rowe had in that fight nico price was very much making it a war late in that fight uh, and i expected him to do it a little bit earlier too maybe even attack with some more wrestling but he was content with just getting picked apart from distance getting dropped a couple times and then eventually finished in that third round bad bet on for me in terms of betting a guy like nico price who i knew was going to be at a technical advantage or disadvantage uh but he was a favorite you know i mean at minus 138 uh, i i feel not as bad about that bet if he was an underdog but i feel bad about it because he was the favorite it was a bad bet now the night finally start to swing a little bit in my mo- in uh, momentum in terms uh, on my side of things the later that this event got but i was already too far into the hole to reconcile much but we do end the night off on two hits the first of which came in the eric anders fight where i picked him as an underdog plus 193 that cashes for 1.93 units now for anybody that watched the episode last week i picked kyle Dock is to win that fight but i was continuously saying that he was not worth that heavy chalk that he was on and once i got that line that i was looking for on eric anders i was going to bet that line again we're betting numbers not fighters so even though i picked kyle Dock is to win on the podcast i hope you guys listen to me in terms of saying that that was not the spot in terms of you know betting him at chalk against a power puncher like eric anders and gladly eric anders goes out there and proves me right cashes the ticket plus 1.93 units and then in the main event i wish i went a little bit deeper on this because i felt hella because i felt hella confident on the wonder boy thompson side knowing that kevin holland in front of a crowd would not look to seek a grapple heavy approach because he wants to go out there and put on a show i knew that would be his downfall you know there's people on the timeline that i saw that were mind blown that kevin holland was not going for takedowns it's Kevin Holland, folks. It's Kevin Holland. Of course, he's going to uh, go out there and try to put on a show. And then once things start not going his way, then he started to grapple. And by then, it was too little, too late. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson already too far ahead and eventually wins that fight due to that. Uh, uh, I forgot what the injury was on, on Kevin Holland, but he just wasn't there. I think it was a hand injury, if I'm not mistaken. But plus 1.56 units on Wonderboy Thompson. I think I am... I'd have to check it, but I think I'm undefeated on betting Stephen Wonderboy Thompson fights. Actually, no, I lied. I, I bet him against uh, Gilbert Burns. Didn't really pay out, play out, but I will continue to hammer home the fact that anytime Wonderboy Thompson fights a guy that is willing to strike with him, Wonderboy is always live, especially as an underdog. Jeff Neal, Vicente Luque, easy cashes in those fights, just as he was an easy cashier against Kevin Holland. So all in all, horrible event worst betting night of the year for your boy minus 10.26 units i think the worst night i had before this this year was about minus six units so like almost double uh the the worst night that i've ever had uh unfortunate that it was for the ufc's comeback event in terms of that one week hiatus they came uh back from but we got two more events to close out the year for UFC. We got a uh, Bellator event this weekend as well. Drop that prediction show already for you guys earlier this week. So check that out if you haven't already. Uh, and I got LFA coming up on Friday as well, which I'm going to be dropping breakdowns on the Patreon. So uh, let me just quickly button up the betting recap. Minus 10.26 units. Not a good look. Not happy with it. But we dust ourselves off. We get back on the horse and we tackle the next event. And luckily for us, there's three events for us this weekend. Like I was just saying, on the table, or sorry the tape next on the uh, patreon i will be dropping lfa breakdowns for the friday card odds just dropped yesterday so i'm happy that uh, i'll finally have like legitimate things that i can uh point to and odds that i can refer to when doing these breakdowns so i'll be tackling that over the next 
you know 12 to 24 hours so if you're on the patreon the the regional mma tier you guys will be getting those breakdowns over the next day or so uh just in time to get your bets in for the lfa event that takes place on friday uh, again bellator picks already out uh, i will be dropping my picks for free for bellator and ufc to the public on friday i'll be sure to get out the bellator picks um you know hours before the event starts so don't worry about that uh but the ufc as well i'll be dropping that on friday afternoon on my social medias if you want to get access to them right now that's where you can find them on the patreon as well link in the description below five bucks a month covers the contender series ufc and bellator the regional mma tier which is 15 dollars a month covers lfa pfl cffc cage warriors and fury fc all those other uh, excluding pfl all those promotions actually have events this month and i'll be covering every single one of them make sure you guys check it out appreciate all the love and support can't do everything for free guys i gotta you know gotta charge sometimes when i'm good at things and when i'm doing as much work as i am that's where the patreon comes into play and that's where i appreciate everybody who supports your boy on that platform all right it is time to finally get into the breakdowns of this ufc 282 card hit that like and subscribe if you haven't already let's get into the breakdowns first fight of the night takes place in the bantamweight division between cameron simon who's coming in as a minus 365 favorite he's going up against short notice newcomer steven Coslow, who's coming in at plus 300 now i'll always remember the uh cameron simon fight on the contender series because everybody was fading him because one there was limited tape on the kid and two everybody was jerking off josh wayne kim like he was this next coming of wonder boy thompson or something like that yes wayne kim had a great striking game and he went up against much more uh, much better competition but there's no need for him to be a minus 250 minus 260 favorite that night i saw enough on tape the limited tape that there was on cameron simon to believe that this kid had value value at plus 200 and i pulled the trigger on him there and was able to cash that ticket he trains out of south africa mainly with drickis duplessis who's obviously on this card as well uh and managed by the same guys there shout out to my guys over there at ruby sports and entertainment uh the kid looks like he's a solid prospect solid potential great all-around game i'd say his striking is probably the best part of his game and he has a developing ground game which is surely going to be tested in this matchup against steven Coslow. We did see, uh, I'm seeing this one little clip of uh, Cameron Simon uh, circulating on, on social media where Josh Wayne Kim has uh, ha is on top of him. He took him down and he's on top of him. And everybody's like, look at this moment. But like, if you watch that, like it's a failed takedown attempt from Cameron Simon that he gets reversed. So Josh Wayne Kim ends up on top of him for five seconds for Cameron Simon it starts to threaten with a guillotine and reverse their position like you got to take things into context and not just take out the one bit of thing that you like about a fighter and you think that's the reason he's going to lose now if you go back and watch one of uh, Cameron Simon's title fights where he went to five rounds against a eight and seven opponent that opponent did have grappling success against him early but Simon was able to get out of those positions get back to his feet and get back to his handiwork which is what I said is his advantage in most of his fights but the Stephen Coslow kid, he is in the same position that Kevin Simon was when he was on the Contender Series and the fact that there is limited footage on him available online. Now, I'll say this about Cameron, or sorry, uh, Stephen Coslow and his manager and those guys. Uh, I believe those, are, those guys are the ones that pulled that footage from uh, YouTube because it was available on YouTube a couple months ago. No longer is the case because they don't want to let the cat out of the bag in terms of what Coslow is going to be doing here. But you look at his record, you look at this couple of fights are still on uh the the internet on youtube and you see what he wants to do he wants to get to get you to the ground and use his superior jujitsu to try to choke you out or tko you on the mat and even if you don't have the footage even if you uh you know can't find any of the youtube fights that he has looking at his record pretty much all wins by submission and look at the gym he's affiliated with 10 plan 10th planet jujitsu in jacksonville we know what the kid's gonna do now i'll say this He's a little bit of an unknown, right? We don't know how good this kid is or how bad this kid is. That's what the issue was with Cameron Simon on the, the Contender Series. So all this unknown, everybody's piling onto the Cameron, si Cameron Simon side here, making him minus 300, minus 400 favor, minus 365 is what I have listed here. But there's no real evidence to back up that he deserves to be that big of a favorite other than the fact that he's fighting a UFC newcomer. 
don't be so quick to jump on the uh, the chalk side on Simon. Now, my prediction is going to be Simon by knockout here. I do think that uh, we'll see a development in his grappling enough that he'll keep this fight upright and then eventually find that knockout because he'll likely be the better striker. But like this Coswell kid could be the next big thing. He's six and zero. You know, I mean, he has a good amount of uh, uh, experience under his belt. Maybe not against the best level of competition. He's 25 years old, probably getting better. What if he is a monster grappler? What if he's a monster wrestler where he's able to get you to the ground with relative ease and then just control you with his superior jujitsu? He will likely have the ground advantage here. So at plus 300, I think he's worth a little bit of a shot just based off of value and the, the a little bit of the unknown, right? Like if Cameron Simon was closer to minus 150, minus 200, I'd be okay with that. But like this number is outrageous. Cameron Simon is still, you know, very early in his uh, MMA career. He turns 22 10 days after the fight. So I feel like I'm going a little bit too long on this matchup because I have a little bit of history with Cameron Simon and betting him on the contender series, but also the issue that people are just, you know, blindly throwing Simon into parlays. You might have to rip up that ticket because Kozlo might actually have some legitimate skill so official prediction like i said is going to be simon inside the distance i think the better play rather than taking him uh or parlaying him is possibly just taking the fight doesn't go to decision maybe a simon knockout or a kozlo submission but taking a little bit of a sprinkle on kozlo's money line i think you know maybe i can just take the profit that i had from the the simon fight and just put it towards that and just use the same uh, same uh, approach in terms of the reasoning behind the bet We'll find out. Prediction, Simon, bet, small sprinkle on Kozlo. All right, let's move on to the next fight here. We got the flyweights coming up and possibly the last time that we see Daniel Da Silva in the UFC. He comes in a plus, uh, as a plus 205 underdog. He's going up against recent contender series signee Venetia Salvador, who's at minus 245. Now, I've cashed on all three Daniel Da Silva fights by taking the under. It was pretty evident after watching his regional tape that this guy either goes out there and starches you in the first round, or if he can't get you out of there by the fourth or fifth minute of a fight, he likely slows down and is vulnerable to getting finished. That's exactly what has happened, at least in two of his fights. Uh, obviously, the, the middle one there against Francisco Figueiredo, he gets taken to the ground, gets knee barred within a minute and a half. But Jeff Molina drags him into the second round and knocks him out uh, pretty viciously, and then in his third fight, his most recent fight in the UFC against uh, Victor Altamoreno. Altamoreno gets him to the ground, ground and pounds him three or four minutes into that first round, gets him out of there. Now, I don't want to discredit how dangerous Daniel Silva can be in the early goings on this fight. He is, you know, explosive. He's fast. He has a lot of power. He has some sneaky jujitsu as well. It's just his cardio, which we cannot trust. Now, you know, uh, his unders in the past were set at two and a half. You were getting plus money on some of them. Now you're getting under one and a half in that minus 200 range. The odds makers and public are finally wise to the fact that this guy is a kill or be killed early type of guy. Vinicius Salvador uh, came into the contender series as a big underdog to Shannon Ross and pulled off an upset and was in control of that fight from the get-go, managing to get that second round knockout. Watching his regional tape, I couldn't hear, understand a word that the Portuguese commentators were saying other than the fact that they kept bringing up Anderson Silva. And you kind of see it in his style. He is a very uh, Muay Thai heavy striker, uh, likes to utilize his um, striking defense with his head movement and his footwork, likes to, you know, play with his opponent. There's even a spot in the Shannon Ross fight where you see him back himself up to the cage and tell him to come come at him because he just likes that, that position. But when he starts to unload on his strikes, he's very difficult to deal with. Now, I do think that this is going to be a barn burner off the jump, and I think that we'll get some back and forth exchange, exchanges. I'm not too high on, you know, bending Salvador on minus 245 because of the early danger coming from the Daniel De Silva side, but I thought the best way to go about it is probably taking De Silva round one plus 500 or whatever, whatever it's sitting at, or Venetia Salvador to win in round two. You can obviously take him in round one as well, but I think round two just being a little cheeky and taking that plus 550 on the round two prop not a bad way of going about it either again under one and a half minus 200 flyweight fight it's it's always tough to try to justify that but i think it will eventually hit i think that we'll see a little bit of a back and forth in the early going here but i think that we'll see salvador put him out in the second round so i'm going to go salvador 
uh, round two. Uh, inside the distance is obviously minus 190. Uh, I'd rather honestly take that than him. Uh, his money line at minus 245. But even that, taking such a chalky number for a specific prop is always a recipe for disaster. Just ask the people that have bet, uh, you know, Gunnar Nelson via submission against Takashi Sato. Like things like that happen. So you always have to be care- careful, always got to be wary. I do think, though, that this is one of those spots where we'll see De Silva stick with his ways, either get that finish early or eventually get finished himself late first round, early second round. I'm hoping second round because I'm going to invest a little bit in that round two prop for Venezia Salvador. All right, let's move on to the next matchup here, which is a featherweight belt between another contender series signee. Uh, I think this is the third fight in the row that this season's contender series uh, fighters making their UFC debut. We got Eric Silva coming in at minus 110 and TJ Brown coming in at minus 110 as well. Now, Eric Silva, he actually opened up as a gigantic favor. I think he was like minus 220 or something like that. And a lot of money coming in on the uh, TJ Brown side to make this fight a pick him. Now I understand it, right? TJ Brown is the um, uh, the veteran here. He has more experience. He's been fighting the higher level of competition. And we've seen more to his game. Whereas Eric Silva, we see him either get the takedown, get taken down, reverse the position. But he's always getting these guys out of there in the first round. I believe his last six fights have all finished inside the first round with him getting his hand raised. He is very dangerous, right? On the contender series, he was lucky that, well, I don't want to say he was lucky. He was fortunate that he outsized his opponent as much as he did, got him to the ground almost immediately, and eventually got uh, that finish via TKO. Phenomenal performance from him. We know what he wants to do. He wants to get you to the ground, and he wants to pummel you through the mat. TJ Brown, on the other hand, likes to grapple as well. He likes his wrestling, and we've seen him use it uh, often, uh, but I think he'll likely have the slight striking advantage in this matchup as well. The spot that I'm personally looking at, because I'm expecting a lot of grappling to take place in this matchup, is the over one and a half. Last time I checked, it was around minus 175, and I think that's a damn good spot. But, um, you know, in terms of picking a side, I just can't really get to the bending window for either guy. There's a lot of unknowns for Eric Sova, who's 35 years old and had only started his professional MMA career six years ago, which is relatively late for a lot of people. Whereas TJ Brown, way more experienced, started way earlier, uh, and and obviously has a tremendous amount of experience under his belt. So in terms of a prediction, I'll go with the TJ Brown side. I think he'll nullify the submission attempts coming from the Eric Silva side. I think he'll grind him out. I think this gets into the second, third, possibly even goes the distance, which is why I like the over one and a half more than anything. But in terms of a prediction, I'll go TJ Brown, TJ Brown by decision. Next up. We go to the featherweights here and we got Billy Q, Billy Quarantillo, coming in at minus 165, welcoming Alexander Hernandez down to the featherweight division. Uh, He's coming in at plus 140. Now, this is a fun, fun fight, right? If there's anything you know about Billy Q, he always produces, you know, fight of the night candidates, essentially. You know, had it not been for that crazy Michael Chandler and... um, who, who did he fight that they had a crazy... Uh, Justin Gaethje. Michael Chandler and Justin Gaethje. Had it not been for that fight, him and Shane Burgos probably would have taken home the fight of the night. And unfortunately for them, they were the next fight after that. And the crowd did not get into it as much as they had uh, for the Chandler and Gaethje fight. Maybe they were already just too worn out from that one. But Burgos and Quarantilla went to war. You know, Billy Q, even though he's usually outmatched in the technical aspects of the fight, he does such a good job of always keeping his pedal or, or foot on the pedal, keeping his foot on the gas, moving forward, throwing strikes, staying active with his jab, with his combinations, with his leg kicks. And then if he feels like he has a grappling advantage over his opponents, he'll look to get them to the ground, you know, smash them through the mat, use his BJJ, get to dominant positions, lock up a submission, get that ground to pound, whatever it is. He is one of those guys that just drags you into deep waters. And, you know, looking at him, he doesn't look physically, you know, imposing or intimidating by any means. But the way that he fights, you know, is makes bitches out of men, essentially. I just, or sorry, yeah. Bitches out of men, essentially, is what I'm trying to say, right? Like, it, it it forces guys to go to depths that they've never gone before. Now, I've been waiting for an opportunity to fade Billy Q, like, earlier in his career. And I thought Gavin Tucker was the perfect guy to do it with. I thought that, that if there was somebody that could deal with the pressure and was technically better than Billy Q, they would be able to get their hand raised. And I was able to cash that under, underdog ticket with Gavin Tucker. But we've seen Gabriel Benitez uh, get finished in the third round. Billy Q was too much for him. Uh, Shane Burgos technically better than Billy Q. It was a closer fight, but Shane Burgos still ends up getting his hand raised. Where does Alexander Hernandez fit into that picture? I think he is athletically more gifted. Um, 
I don't know if he's technically better than Billy Q. I think Billy Q does a lot of things great. But Hernandez, a lot of his success has come from just being the athletic specimen that he is, the, the strength and the power that he has. But like I, I do think that he can succumb to the grind and the pace and the pressure that Billy Q puts on his opponents. So there's a couple ways you can go about this fight. Violence, right? I, I'm expecting violence in this matchup. I do think that Billy Q is very live to win this fight late. You know what I mean, round three plus 1100, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That might be a perfect way to go about this fight. But I do like Billy Q inside the distance, which currently sits at plus 155. You know, I don't know what the weight cut is going to look like for uh, Alexander Hernandez. We're, we're, we're not 100% certain how that's going to go for him. You know, I'm recording this on Wednesday night, uh, you know, before the fights and weigh-ins are 36 hours from now or whatever the hell it is. Right, there, there's still a lot of time between now and then. We'll see how he does with that weight cut. He has complete competed at 145 pounds, but that was nine years ago. I mean, it's been a long time, and he's pretty much filled out this lightweight frame pretty well over the last several years. So, I, I do think good cut or bad cut. We've seen how Alexander Hernandez fade late in fights. We've seen him struggle against guys later in fights, and the last guy you want to be struggling against late in fights is Billy Quarantillo. So I don't mind the money line on him. Minus 165, not a bad line. But I think honing in specifically on the inside the distance at plus 155 will luckily be or likely be the best way to get the best bang for your buck. So give me Billy Q inside the distance. Let's sprinkle a little bit of that round three prop as well, if you know what I'm saying. All right, let's get to this next, next fight, which takes place in the middleweight division. Should be a very fun fight. Can't wait to see how it goes down. I will do my best to break it down for you guys but I'm a little bit questionable about it. We got Chris, the action man, Curtis, coming in at plus 140, and Joaquin Buckley coming in at minus 165. Now, Buckley coming off a loss after uh, back in September where he traveled overseas to Paris to, f- to fight Nasruddin Imavov in his home country, and he came up short that night. He had some decent moments of his own, but it was that technical striking and even some of the grappling of Imavov that caused Joaquin Buckley some issues. Buckley, at his best, is able to traverse the cage, utilize his kicks, and follow it up with punches to either knock out his opponents or land more damaging strikes to get his hand raised via decision. Chris Curtis, on the other hand, he's a guy that had benefited from short notice spots a ton of times, not to mention the fact that he was able to get his UFC debut against Phil Hawes on short notice and pull off a tremendously big upset that night, uh, knocking Phil Phil Hawes in that knocking out phil haas in that first round uh after getting butchered uh you know for the first couple minutes he follows that up with another big win over uh brendan allen where he knocks him out as well uh and then he follows that up with the you know a pretty pedestrian victory over Rodolfo Vieira, where he's stuffing takedowns and getting off and off shots that he can win that fight just off of this uh uh damage loan but then came his uh, you know, big mistake, which was taking a short notice fight the next month, right after the Rodolfo Vieira fight against Jack Hermanson, who is a huge middleweight, right? We're talking about a guy in Chris Curtis who used to fight at 170. He seems to be comfortable now at 185 pounds, but Jack Hermanson is a big dude. Now, he did a good job in terms of stopping any type of takedown approach that Jack Hermanson was trying to threaten him with, but he could not get a beat on him in terms of the, you know, touch and go style that Jack Hermanson was using in that fight. He stayed at distance and just picked apart Chris Curtis, and Curtis could do nothing to get his game going because he thrives in pocket exchanges. Jack Hermanson wanted none of that. Now with Buckley, Buckley has had his success in terms of exchanging with fighters in pocket exchanges, but I do think that he's going to uh, look to you know traverse the cage a little bit more, use his kicks from the outside, follow that up with punches, and then get back out into distance. I don't think he wants to trade with Chris Curtis. Curtis is so good at div- diversifying his striking arsenal by you know going to the body and waiting for you to drop your guard so that he can go back to the head. He's great at combinations. He's He has a great overall striking game, but he thrives when guys are willing to strike with him in the pocket. And I don't think that's what we're going to get from Buckley here. I think if Buckley is smart, he's going to be kicking and moving, kicking and moving, not as much as Hermanson was doing, but uh, but just enough that he can you know, really nullify the amount of times that Chris Curtis can land on him with combinations, dig to the body and do what he does best. I'm leaning the over in this fight more than anything. You know, I don't really trust Buckley at that minus 165 range because Chris Curtis, you know, a veteran of the game. I'm sure he's fought a guy like Buckley in the past, but I think he's going to struggle to really get a beat on Buckley and that will ultimately be why he ends up dropping this fight. 
I'm going to go Buckley, Buckley by decision. But uh, the overs, I think, are at plus money, which I don't think is a bad spot. You know, everybody always expects Chris Curtis or Joaquin Buckley to be in these fights that produce knockouts, right? Like the Vieira and Chris Curtis fight was a perfect example of that, where the fight doesn't go to decision, was chalked as hell. People have to rip up their parlays because of that. Joaquin Buckley against Abdul Razak Al Hassan, another spot where everybody was banging on my window saying, hey, fight doesn't go to decision lock it on i play lock it up parlay it with something i'm like nah dog i don't see it happening because we see time and time again where fighters with big knockout power just respect each other too much and we see the fight go the distance now i thought that's what was going to happen last week with pavlovich and tai tuivasa but i didn't bet it <laughs> you know i mean i didn't bet the fight goes to decision or the overs or anything like that because i knew how volatile it could potentially be same thing in this aspect. So uh, I will pick Joaquin Buckley as my prediction, but I have no interest in him betting on him at this line that he's currently at. All right, let us move on to the next fight here, which takes place also in the middleweight division. We got Edmund Shabazian coming in at minus 295, fighting for his job, fighting to avoid a four-fight losing streak. He's going up against Dalcha Lungiambula, who's also fighting to avoid a four-fight losing streak and possibly a pink slip outside of the UFC. Now, Edmund Shabazian, it wasn't that long ago, just before COVID, where he was everybody's darling. Right? He was the big favorite against a guy like Derek Brunson. And after he's not able to knock him out early, we saw that we see the gas tank issues come into play. And that seems to be what his uh, detriment was over this three fight losing streak. He can have early success no matter what. He can put guys on you know, the, the doorstep of being finished, but he still struggles if, they're, if he's not able to get those guys out of there and then trying to keep up with them later on that fights go. So. Edmund Shabazian has completely changed up his game, turned his you know training camp on his head, moved on over to Extreme Couture in Las Vegas, hoping for one last career, well not last, he's still pretty young, but at least one last UFC resurgence by trying to mix it up with the guys over there at Extreme Couture, Eric Nixick, great training staff there, not to mention great training partners for him as well. This could be good things for him. You know, Dalcha actually spent a, a, a training camp or two over there at Extre- or over there at Extreme Couture, but he ended up fighting another Extreme Couture guy in his last fight against Punehalo Soriano, where he ended up getting knocked out in the second round of that fight. But Edmund Shabazian, let's go back to him. He, great striking, great combination, great speed, great great power, uh, solid. Uh, you know, grappling. That's probably one of the best ways that he can. Or sorry, I'd say his strength is a striking, but he has a good enough grappling game to remain safe in those spots as long as his gas tank holds up. So that's one aspect of his game that I'm looking forward to seeing if he's improved or not. But I don't think we get deep enough in this fight to find out whether he has improved his gas tank or not. Because I think that he, you know, Dalcha is pretty fast and explosive himself, but I think that Edmund has more uh, substance to his explosiveness and his power. Right, he throws in combinations. He doesn't just wade in and try to knock you out with these big winging shots, similar to Dalcha. He more so waits for his openings, then explodes with the combination, most of which are straight down the middle and usually meet the target before the target is able to counter effectively. And I think that is where we'll see Edmund really shine in this spot. I think that we'll see him counter Dalcha effectively here. Uh, even if Dalcha wants to you know, push him up against the cage and have a grinding affair, I think we'll see Edmund do very well early to get off the cage, get back to distance, get back to his kicks, his punches, and his combinations, and I think he'll eventually knock him out. Dalcha, 35 years old, seems to be breaking down a little bit uh, in terms of his uh, physical capabilities. And I think that we'll see Edmund save his UFC career here by going out there, landing a big shot on Dalcha and putting him out. Do I trust him at minus 295 though? No, you shouldn't trust anybody at this big of a price tag who has a clear gas tag advantage. Dalcha has been 25 minutes in the past. I mean, Dalcha has a decent enough gas tank, in my opinion, that if he is successful with clinching Edmund up against the cage and grinding him for the first seven minutes of the fight, he will likely be the liver fighter the later that this fight goes. So don't attach yourself to a minus 295. Attach yourself to the better price, which in my opinion is Edmund inside the, the distance, unless there's a completely different Edmund coming out and Extreme Couture has completely retool, retooled his game plan or his, uh, or his skill set, I should say which I don't think they'll do. Like I know Eric Nixick, Eric Nixick is very good at uh, allowing fighters to exaggerate what they're good at, right? Like they focus on what their strengths are and tries to exaggerate that so that they can get the best out of their fighters. And I think that's what they're going to do here with Edmund, especially with this matchup. Utilize your striking, utilize your movement, 
your explosiveness and your power, get that knockout victory early in this matchup. So I'm going to go Edmund, Edmund via finish, probably first round, but I'd rather take that than take the minus 295. If you want to play it safer and maybe take the fight doesn't go to decision, that's possible too. But I really think that this is going to end up being an Edmund finish and it's probably going to be early in this fight as well. All right. You want to talk about finishes? Let's get to the heavyweights who come up next year between uh, Jerzinho Rosenstrike, who comes in at minus 170, and Chris Dacus, who comes in at plus 145, hoping to avoid his third straight loss in a row. Let's start off on the Philly native side here in Chris Dawkins, who's coming off a loss to Chris, or sorry, Curtis Blades back in March, where he got knocked out in the, I believe, the second round of their fight. I could be off on that, but, um, you know, Curtis Blades showcasing that he can strike too. And a lot of people might say that, you know, that's a bad thing for uh, Chris Curtis, right? Or I keep wanting to say Chris Curtis. (laughs) <laughs> that might be a bad thing for Chris Dawkins if he's getting knocked out by a wrestler like Curtis Blades. But what Curtis Blades does well, and I think he's starting to accept it now, which is good for him, is he's using the threat and the intimidation of the takedown to open up with the striking. That's why he was so successful successful against Derek Lewis in the first round of their fight until he forced the wrestling in the second round and eventually got knocked out for his problems, right? If he just stayed with the striking, with the length, and just kicked Derek Lewis from the outside every now and then, came in with a couple punches, maybe he could have knocked out Derek Lewis in that fight. But he forced the grappling, ended up getting knocked out. Now, this Chris Dawkins fight, we saw him flow with it a little bit more, and that allowed him to open up his striking and really let his power go. And that's how, that's where I think Chris Dawkins got caught up in. He was trying to defend striking while also defend the potential of a takedown coming his way, and he ended up getting knocked out for it. Luckily for him... He has none of that to worry. Well, at least not the wrestling aspect to worry here about uh, with Yarzinho uh, Rosenstrike. Um, he'll Dawkins will likely have the combination striking advantage here, possibly even the speed advantage. But I do think ultimately he is going to succumb to that big power of Rosenstrike, who's had a you know a decent kickboxing background as well. I don't feel confident at that minus 170 range that Rosenstrike is in because one, he did get finished back in June, although some may say it was an early stoppage, but I think if Volkov continued to punch, he probably would have knocked him out cold. So we know Rosenstrike can be hurt and we know he can be put out by anybody other than Francis Ngannou. So Chris Dawkins has that going for him. He could potentially find the chin of Rosenstrike here and put him out. But I do think that at a certain point that Rosenstrike is going to hit him with the counter that Dawkins is not going to be able to eat and that will likely be the end of the night for Dawkins. Uh, you know, Dawkins is probably the better minute winner here as well. So if this fight does go deep, I do think he is live to win rounds and bank rounds compared to the, you know, lower output striking style of Rosenstrike. But I think at a certain point, probably early in this fight, we're going to see Rosenstrike land that big bomb and get him out of there. I just don't like the minus 170 line to bank on a guy to only get that big knockout to win a fight, right? Like, I don't know. I I, I just, I don't feel good about the fight. The under one and a half, a little bit chalky. Uh, Rosenstrike inside the distance, minus 125, probably better than taking the minus 170. But I personally want nothing to do with this fight. I'm going to be staying away from it all in all. All right, let's get to the bantamweights and the UFC debut of the phenom of the contender series outside of Bo Nickel. Raul Rosas Jr., who comes in at minus 230. Jay Perron, who comes in at plus 195. I don't know why I want to make Perron's name, you know, so French. Maybe it is spe- or pronounced that way. I'll leave it to John Anik to let me know this weekend. But um, very interesting fight here between two primary grapplers, right? Raul Rosas Jr. came into the contender series and people were talking about him weeks before he even competed because he was 17 years old at the time that he competed. He turned 18 a couple of weeks after that matchup and is still 18 at this point. But it's not often that you see a fighter this young in the UFC be this big of a favorite. But the kid deserves it. You know I mean, he has a very strong wrestling uh, or sorry, very strong grappling background, which mainly incorporates the jiu-jitsu. But his wrestling seems to be on par as well because fighters just can't stop him from taking them to the mat. Now, Perrin is probably one of the better fighters that he's competed against, so there are the question marks of whether minus 230 is an accurate line for Rosas Jr., but I do think that Rosas will get those takedowns and those positions when he needs to. Perrin, I backed him as a slight underdog against Orichi Lang last time around because I thought his grappling advantage would be enough for him to ground Orichi over and over again, but it just wasn't enough. Orichi Lang kept getting back to his feet, kept damaging him on the feet, obviously won the judge's decision based off the damage that he was landing. But 
Perrin is going up against another grappler here, and I think that uh, he's going to struggle with the BJJ advantage that Rosas Jr. is going to have in this matchup. Um, you know, people are going to be waiting, you know, just biding their time to Faye Rosas Jr. because he's going to obviously always be the big favorite in his matchup because of the hype around his name. Um, that's pretty much it. But, you know, his grappling is on point. It's definitely up there. You know, he could beat uh, a good majority of the bantamweights on the roster right now just with his grappling alone. Perrin's not the guy, though. Perrin is not the one that you want to be putting your money on to try to spoil the party of Rosas Jr. He might have the slight striking advantage here, but nothing makes me believe that he's going to, one, knock out Rosas Jr., two, deal with the grappling, uh, you know, uh, effectively here. We saw Rosas Jr. deal with a little bit of adversity on the contender series against Mando Gutierrez, who might be a better fighter than Jay Perron, if I'm being honest. But even when he was put in bad positions, Rosas Jr., that is, he doesn't settle. Like he, he will willingly give up worse positions because he feels more comfortable getting out of those positions, right? There, there was a, um, you know, I, I've seen him give up, uh, I think it was half guard to get into, uh, to allow his opponent to take his back. And then he'll just spin out of those uh, positions so that he ends up on top. Like, not a lot of fighters are comfortable putting themselves in those bad positions because they don't trust themselves to get out of it. But Rosales Jr. has that confidence. It might not work here against Perrin, but I, I feel like, I personally think it will. I, I just don't believe in Perrin in this position. Nor do I feel really good about taking that minus 230 on Rosales Jr. either. So maybe target Rosales Jr. by submission might be the best way to go about it or even taking the under in this fight. Um... But I do, I do think at a certain point, Rosas finds that submission, gets him out of there, you know, gets that first UFC victory under his belt. But it's going to be the fights after that that we see how legit he actually is and if he will really be what the UFC thinks he's going to be. Uh, you know, be that 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 fighter from Mexico that they want Brandon Moreno to be or the fighter that they want Cain Velasquez to be. Maybe Rosas could do it with all this experience that he's going to accrue on the, the UFC scene. Hopefully they build him up nice and slow because this kid could be a problem. Let's be honest. All right, let's get to the next fight here. A phenomenal fight in the featherweight division. We got Bryce Mitchell coming in as a plus 115 underdog. He's going up against hot prospect Ilya Tapuria, who comes in at minus 135. Now, I love this fight. You know, I mean, I love both guys. I love the trajectory that they're both on. You know, I've been following Ilya Taporia even before he fought on the Cage Warrior scene. I bet him back then against Brian Buland. Like, I've had a long history of following Ilya Taporia. There was a stretch in time where he wasn't really that active and, you know, wasn't really getting noticed by the big promotions. And then, out of nowhere, he gets signed on short notice to the UFC, goes up against Yusuf Zalal, wins that fight, uh, you know, not the best performance, but still goes out there, earns that decision victory, but since then has been absolutely dusting fools, right? He has faced a lot of adversity in some of those matchups. Jai Herbert nearly knocking him out in the first round of their fight, but he comes back and knocks him out in the second round. Uh, Ryan Hall, no real adversity in that fight, and ends up ground and pounding and finishing him. Damon Jackson, you know, Jackson didn't really have much for him there. Uh, Ilya Tapuria knocks him out as well. So Tapuria, one of the first ever black belts uh, out of Spain, uh, you see it in his game. When he is able to get fights to the ground, he's very good at passing guard and getting to dominant positions and finishing his opponents. But his striking game is very much coming along, and that's likely going to be his best advantage in this matchup against Bryce Mitchell. Uh, you see the confidence in which he throws with and I love the fact that he just doesn't throw one shot right um, when he went up against uh, Jai Herbert he knew he had to throw multiple shots to close that distance and to get Jai Herbert to react to one so that he can throw another one to catch him off guard that's exactly how he got the knockout throws the overhand right left to the body uh, I, I could be getting the hands wrong here, but I believe it was a three-punch combination. It was one up top, one to the body, and then another one up top. And Jai Herbert thought it was only going to be two punches. Little does he know he was going to get slept by the third, which is why Ilya Tapori ends up winning that fight. Bryce Mitchell's striking is not at that level, in my opinion. He is still that pot shot or two takedown kind of guy. He needs those takedowns to win fights. You know, he, he rocked Edson Barboza in his last fight because Edson Barboza was so worried about the takedowns coming his way. Ilya Taporia, I don't think he'll be as worried about the takedowns coming his way, which will allow him to flow a little bit better with the striking. But even if this fight does hit the ground, which inevitably I think it will, his BJJ black belt is going to come into play here, right? 
this isn't a uh, Charles Rosa black belt who just, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, for perpetually just stays on his back and can do nothing about it. This is a guy who's actively going to be working to one, either reverse position or two, get back to his feet. And I think that we'll see him deal with the ground game decently enough here so that he can um, take advantage of the striking advantage that he's going to have. And I think at a certain point, he follows up on a knockout here and gets that finish over Bryce Mitchell. Um, earlier in the week, him at that minus 170, minus 180 range, I wanted nothing to do with it. But with that action coming in on Bryce Mitchell earlier this week, and now we got Tupori around minus 135, this is a better entry than minus 170 or minus 180, in my opinion. I do believe this fight is closer than those odds initially um, uh, projected or implied. But now at minus 135, I feel like we had uh, we have a legit edge uh, on the odds here to take the favorite in Tupuria to showcase that he's the better overall fighter and hopefully land that knockout for us. All right, let's get to the next fight here. And I thought I said that Chris Curtis against Joaquin Buckley was the biggest question mark for me. I lied. It's actually this upcoming middleweight belt. We got Darren Till coming in as a plus 155 favorite. Drick is two plus is coming in at minus. Sorry, did I say plus 155 favorite? I meant plus 155 underdog. Drick is two plus is coming in as the minus 180 favorite. Now, Darren Till has had such a tumultuous run over his last several fights, right? Even dating back to the Tyron Woodley fight. I think he's only had one victory in that span, which was that fight against Kelvin Gastelum at UFC 244. Gets his hand raised there via decision. Not the greatest performance, but good enough for him to get his hand raised. But still going out there and uh, having trouble against other opponents. Last time around we saw him was against Derek Brunson, where he couldn't stuff a takedown, kept getting taken down, and eventually finished in that third round. It comes out afterwards, though, that he was dealing with a knee injury. A pretty bad knee injury. I believe it was a torn ACL. But he's had so many injuries over the last couple years broken collarbone which took him out of a fight against Marvin Vittori pulled out again uh, of a couple other fights due to injury but the most recent one that we know about is the ACL injury but it's been over a year or so now or just over a year um, since that fight since that procedure since the recovery and we've seen him completely turn his preparation on its head as well we saw him uh, usually training out of the, I believe it was the London Shoe Fighters Gym. I could be off on that, but it was those guys over there to, uh, in England that he was training with. The guys that he was, oh, Team team Corbin. Corbin? It's where Tom Aspinall it trains. I, I don't remember the name. It starts with a K, but that's where he used to train. But he has spent time over in Sweden with Hamza Shmaev at the All-Stars Training Center, but has also most recently, I believe for the last eight weeks or so, been training in Thailand. Splitting time between Bang Tao Muay Thai, which is headed by the Hickman brothers, and Tiger Muay Thai, where you have a tremendous crop of international fighters uh, training there, and you're able to get in such high-level training that you know that you're, you're going to be more than prime and ready to go whenever fight time comes around. But I just don't know what kind of dare until we're going to get. You know, you, you, is he truly healed? Is he... Does he have his facilities about him? Uh, I just saw an interview that he did with Mike Bond earlier today, where he... Uh, he said he had all these traveling issues. You know, he had to go from Thailand to South Korea to, you know, I forgot where else they said. I think they said they ended up landing in Seattle and then from Seattle down to Las Vegas. Like, they had all these issues. He said it took them four days to get to Las Vegas from Thailand. That's got to count for something, right? I'm not going to say that's the, the make or break reason as to why he might end up losing this fight, but that needs to be taken into consideration. But let's say Darren Till at his best. At his best, uses his range very well, utilizes his you know opportunistic striking approach to land the better strikes against his opponents, sometimes knocking them out, sometimes running by decision. But the fact of the matter is, he hasn't secured a knockout in over five years. Last time he knocked somebody out was Cowboy Cerrone, I believe it was. That was five years ago. So like we, we need to put those things into perspective. But then again, like he hasn't really won a fight outside of the Calvin Gaslam fight since that Cerrone fight either. So that's my question mark. What kind of Darren Till are we going to get? Because this Thailand version of Darren Till might be a mythical creature that, we, you know, just looks amazing. But the other thing to take into consideration is I believe this is going to be his fourth fight now up at middleweight. But I think that this is only going to be the second fight that he competed against a true middleweight. Because the advantage that he used to have in the welterweight division was his size. Excuse me. His frame, you know, his distance management was a lot easier when he was fighting guys that were a lot smaller than him, 
We saw it in the Calvin Gaston fight, who's a blown up middleweight. We kind of saw it in the Robert Whitaker fight, although Robert Whitaker's skills allow him to be much better at middleweight than he was at welterweight. But Derek Brunson, you know what I mean, kept taking him down. But there is the asterisk of the fact that he had a torn ACL going into that fight. Drake is to Plessis is going to have a one inch height advantage. He's going to have a two to three inch reach advantage as well. So how does Darren Till play that outside game when he's not going to be the bigger fighter in there? Not to mention, he's going up against a big power puncher and Drake is Duplessis as well. What if Duplessis times a perfectly, uh, you know, uh, a perfectly timed counter to find the chin of Darren Till and put him out? What I liked about, now, now let's switch over to du, the Duplessis side, who all of his wins had pretty much come by finish up until his last fight against Brad Tavares. A lot of people were questioning Drakus's cardio, right? How does he look later in fights? He looked phenomenal in that Brad Tavares fight. Kept his foot on the gas. I think he's now averaging over six and a half significant strikes landed per minute. He stays with the output, stays with the consistency, stays in his opponent's face. Darren Till's going to have some issues with that, in my opinion, unless Darren Till lands a counter of his own and puts him out. So there's so many ways that this fight can go. I do still end up on the Duplessis side because... I'll go with the more active fighter, the fighter that's been showing improvements, the the fighter that's been in the cage way more than Darren Till over the past three years. But I just don't like that minus 180 line because there is so much unknown about Darren Till. So, you know, shout out to my guy Marcus Williams, who I believe has like uh, close to $6,000 down on Drake's Duplessis right now. You know, I think he cashes the ticket. I think Duplessis wins, but I don't have that type of confidence on him. Uh, you know, the decision prop is a little intriguing at plus 350 because this could just end up being like a pitter-patter back-and-forth striking battle that goes the full 15 minutes, but it ends up being Duplessis who gets his hand raised because he was a little bit more active than Darren Till. So I'm going to pick Duplessis to win, Duplessis by decision, but this is my pass fight of the night. I, I understand people taking the potential value that you can get on Darren Till at that plus money that he's at, because I believe his skill set is much better than his recent run has has shown us. But we still don't know what kind of Darren Till we're going to get. That's why I'm so confused about this matchup. So I'll take Duplessis. Duplessis by decision. Want nothing to do with the fight. All right, let's move on to the next fight, which takes place at a catch weight of 180 pounds. We got Santiago Ponzinibbio coming in as a minus 180 favorite, going up against Alex the Great White Morono, who comes in at plus 155. He's stepping in on short notice for Robbie Lawler, who unfortunately had to put out or pull out, uh, I think, late last week. Morono puts his hand or, or puts his hand up. UFC picks him. Now in he comes. This should be a fun fight. Both guys, mainly strikers. Alex Morono, a BJJ black belt. But you wouldn't know that depending on or, or based on how he fights. The guy just likes to go out there and strike. You know, it took him until like his fifth, sixth, or even seventh UFC fight to actually shoot a takedown. You know what I mean? I, I still remember when uh, me and Cody were breaking down uh, his fight against Reese McKee. And I'm like, maybe this is the fight that Morono finally goes for a takedown. And Cody was laughing at me. He goes, what are you talking about? This guy hasn't shot a takedown in forever. He's fought so many strikers, never went for a takedown. I'm like, maybe this is the one. Then he finally did. But even since then, he doesn't really go after it. He utilizes for pressure, uh, relies on his durability a lot, and just tries to overwhelm his opponents, right? Even when guys are athletically more gifted than him and possibly even more technically gifted than him or, or technically more skilled than him, He's able to break them and just keep walking forward and, you know, feeding them shot after shot, just like the Matthew Samuelsberger fight in his last fight. But I think that this is a great fight for Ponzinibbio for target practice, right? Uh, Ponzinibbio on a bit of a, uh, a little bit of a uh, skid of his own, I think, two-fight losing streak. He lost to Michel Pereira uh, last time around, lost to Jeff Neal, the fight before that split decision loss. But he's been competitive in a lot of them, right? He hasn't really been the the guy that we thought he was back in 2018 where he was on a seven fight winning streak just finished neil magni in front of his home crowd in argentina but then he had this crazy terrible disease that was like a blood infection of some sort of bacterial disease that kept him out of competition for over two years came back against Jing leon gets knocked out at the end of the first round in that fight bounces back with a win over miguel baeza didn't you know had some adversity in that fight but master pull away later in that fight but then ends up losing to jeff neal and uh, michelle Pereira. but this is a better fight for him right Pereira and and uh, jeff neal technically solid strikers 
sound strikers, combination strikers. Michel Pereira, you know, likes to uh, skirt on the outside, use his kicks and his movement, and that was a little bit hard for Ponzinibbio to track him and hit him. But Alex Morono, I guess hittable. You know, I mean, he just moves forward. He doesn't really use head movement well. Um, his defensive uh, striking is very much lacking. And Ponzinibbio will likely have every advantage over this guy. I think he tears up his lead leg. He lets go on his punches afterwards and possibly knocks out Alex Morono. So at minus 180, I think that's a great line on Pons here. He has Morono covered pretty much everywhere. You know, Morono is not a great wrestler, so I don't think he's going to try to use his BJJ here against Pons and Ibio. And Pons and Ibio's defensive grappling is not that bad either. It's good enough to deal with whatever Morono is going to throw at him. But I think that this will remain as a striking battle, and I think it's going to come out with Pons and Ibio getting a knockout. You can take the violence bet here if you want. If you want the under two and a half, fight doesn't go to decision. I do think that these guys are going to land on each other early and often, but I think it's going to be the speed, power, and the more preparedness for Ponzinibbio that ends up getting him the win here. Remember, Alex Morono only had eight days to prepare for this fight, maybe less. Ponzinibbio has been training for this fight for months, weeks, against Robbie Lawler in a fight that you know, probably will play out similar to this, but Morono maybe not it. Okay, actually, I guess Morono is a little bit more dangerous than Robbie Lawler because Lawler is probably at the tail end of his career and very much compromised at this point in time. But Morono, let's not forget, you know, Chaos Williams was able to put this guy out completely. Uh, Chaos Williams, tremendous power in his own right, but Ponce Nivio still has power in my opinion too. And I think he can knock out Morono. But rather than just taking the knockout prop, I think taking Ponce Nibio on his mind line at minus 180 might end up looking like a very genius bet once this uh, fight is all said and done. So I'm going to go uh, Moro- or Ponce Nibio, Ponce Nibio by knockout. Sign me up. All right, that brings us to our co-main event of the evening where we have fan favorite Patty the Batty Pemblet coming in at minus 245. He's going up against Jared Flash Gordon who comes in at plus 205 now this fight was originally rumored to take place when patty originally fought uh jordan levitt a couple months back but didn't come to fruition but here we are now in december finally getting this matchup this is the matchup that i've been salivating for to potentially get some good plus money on the underdog which i knew was going to be jared gordon now jared gordon there are some durability issues that we need to you know keep in mind which is why we shouldn't make this like a lock of the night play by any means but i think that he has a very good shot in terms of beating a guy like patty pimblett uh gordon at his best similar to a billy quarantillo fighting style where he just moves forward throws in combinations keeps the pressure on his opponents goes for the takedowns when he needs to and just grinds these guys out and just breaks them right the perfect uh example of a jared gordon fight is his last fight against leonardo santos actually maybe not so much because he didn't take him down as much because he was worried about the high level bjj that would come back his way but he did against danny chavez you know i mean he kept on the 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 gas stayed in his face made it very difficult for chavez to have any success there cash that underdog take it on jared gordon now we're getting up to you know plus 220 on certain books on jared gordon this is the best fight that or best fighter that pimblet has far in the ufc to date He's minus 245. Again, durability issues are there for Jared Gordon. But from a complete fighter standpoint, Jared Gordon has all the, the tools to beat a guy like Pimblet. Pimblet throws with reckless abandon on the feet. Pimblet has, uh, you know, his strength would probably be his grappling. If he's able to get top position on the mat, he could probably do some damage on uh, Jared Gordon. But if Gordon's durability holds up here, he might look like bet of the year. Like he could put the pressure on Patty Pimblet, and I don't expect Patty to break. I think that guy has too big, I don't want to say an ego. I want to say he has so much confidence in himself that he always believes he's in a fight, even if he's losing it from the first bell. So I think he'll be in this fight the entire time and he's going to be dangerous the entire time. But just as the Molly McCann experiment kind of blew up a couple uh, weeks ago against Aaron Blanchfield, we're getting actually a good plus money to fade the hype train on Patty Pimblet with a, a, a legit opponent here in Jared Gordon. So I already pulled the trigger earlier this week. He's my dog of the night play. I think this is a great spot for him to go out there and do what Jared Gordon does. I think he'll avoid the big bombs of Pimblet. I think he'll make this a grindy, gritty fight. I think he'll push Pimblet up against the cage, maybe land some takedowns, but just keep the pressure on him, put the combinations on him, put the punches on him, and wear Pimblet down, win this fight via decision. Gordon by decision, currently sitting at plus 450. I love that line. 
I like it. But even just as money line, no need to get greedy. Plus 205, perfect spot to take the entry on him. I know in the comment section, I'm probably going to get lit up here because of all the Patty the Batty lovers out there. And he might win. Patty might win. Patty might knock him out. But there's going to be come a time where that ticket is going to get ripped up and people are going to be kicking themselves for taking the big chalk on Patty. Patty's hype and image far outweighs his skill set. He's a skilled fighter. Don't get me wrong. He deserves to be in the UFC. But I think there are going to be guys with stylistic approaches that are going to cause him trouble. I think Jared Gordon is one of them. So give me Gordon to pull off the upside here. Win via decision, plus 450. Let's go. All right, that brings us to our main event. Before we get there, though, make sure you guys hit that like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you want Bellator breakdowns, I've already dropped them earlier this week. Check my channel. You'll see the... Uh, the prediction video posted there if you want action on lfa that's how you can uh, that's why you should check out the patreon link is in the description below lfa cffc cage warriors and fury fc all being covered on the patreon best bets and props article for every fight on that card that has odds attached to them at least uh i will be breaking down on the patreon in case you guys want some more degenerate mma action also betting ufc betting banned in ontario i don't know about that I know where you can get action down still. Link in the description below. Two of the most trusted offshore books on the market. Check the link in the description below. We both get a little bit of a kickback from that link. Bet online. Bodog. I got you guys covered. I promise. All right. Let's get to this main event, which takes place in the light heavyweight division for the vacant light heavyweight title. We got former title holder Jan Blachowicz coming in as a plus 235 underdog. He's going up against uh, the, probably the toughest fighter in this division, probably the best fighter in this division, Magomed Ankulayev, who comes in at minus 280. Now, I've been tooting the Magomed Ankulayev horn since he first came into the UFC, and even though he got choked out by Paul Craig in the dying seconds of that fight, I still knew that this guy would eventually be champion, and luckily for him, his time has finally come. All speedy wishes and recovery for the champion Yuri Prohaska. And hopefully Glover Teixeira eventually throws his hand back into the championship ring because we know his career is f coming to an end in the very near future. Probably would have came to an end had he beaten Yuri Prohaska back in June. But the Magomed on era has now begun, folks. This guy is a tremendously complete fighter. Let's start off with the striking. This guy can comfortably strike from both stances. I haven't seen that from a fighter in the light heavyweight division since John Jones. And what I mean by that is he can fight as comfortably southpaw as he can do from the orthodox position. But what he does is fuck with his opponent. You know, whenever his opponent is in the orthodox position, he will switch to the opposite stance. He'll go southpaw. His opponent wants to go southpaw, he'll go orthodox. But like you need, he he needs to see that his opponent is comfortably going to that other stance. That's when we'll see him switch to stance. I think it was even the Klitz and Abreu fight. If you guys go watch that, that's where you'll see Uncle Ives change stances every time Klitz and changes stances. But even in the uh, Tiago Santos fight, the every you know small, uh, any time that Tiago San Santos switched his stance for more than ten seconds, you'll see Uncle Ives switch his stance as well. He always makes his, makes it difficult for his opponents to fight in that opposite stance. Now, we saw Jan Blachowicz had some success against a, uh, an opposite stance fighter against Dominic Reyes, where he kept using that body kick on the near side of, uh, of Dominic Reyes and very much bruised it up, which eventually led to the knockout, I believe, in the second or third round of that fight. And that was his title clinching performance, which just so happened to be for a vacant light heavyweight title as well. Right, that was right when John Jones vacated the title and put it up for grabs for Dominic Reyes, who was the last fighter that Jones beat, and Jan Blachowicz, who was deserving at that time. So that's just a striking of Magomed Ankalaev, right? He has good power, great combinations, never really overextends, never really overthrows. We very rarely ever see him in a compromised position. I think the last one was when he fought Thiago Santos. He got rocked at the end of that second round, but after that, cleaned it up. Didn't have any issues after that. And a lot of, I saw a lot of people want to write him off because of that one instance. People are, you know, great fighters are going to have slip-ups every now and then. But for the most part, for 99% of the time, squeaky clean. Then he has his wrestling that he can back up on, right? The, uh, the was it the Vulcan Uzdemir? No, the Vulcan Uzdemir fight, he outstruck him. The Nikita Krilov fight. Krilov, good style, right? Uh, a lot of output, uh, a lot of strikes, 
staying consistent. And the uncle I was like, you know what? This is too much. The judges might not like this for me. So I'm going to look to take this to the to take this fight to the ground, grind him out, so I can secure that decision victory. Blahovich, I think he's a BJJ black belt. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, last I remembered, he was a brown belt. He should be a black belt by now. But uh, crafty off of his back, but not crafty enough like Paul Craig. People might point back at that Paul Craig and be like, or that Paul Craig fight and be like, Blahovich is live because Paul Craig submitted him and Blahovich has a decent ju- jiu-jitsu game of his own. Not like Paul Craig. Paul Craig is an anomaly. You know, I mean, we never see anybody in the light heavyweight division who's as offensively minded off their back like Paul Craig and actually attacks it aggressively. We don't see that. That's not Jan Blahovich. So if Uncle Ivan wants to take this fight to the ground and grind out Blahovich, nothing is stopping him from doing so. In the striking realm, yes, Blahovich has that Polish power, but I think we'll see that discipline from Ankalaev really shine through here, keeping Blahovich on the end of his strikes, keeping him at distance, letting go on his strikes when he needs to. And if he feels any type of pressure at all, I think he can mix in those takedowns behind his combinations and stay safe in that realm. So I really like Ankalaev in this spot. That's why I made sure that this was the first fight that I taped so I can get as good of a line as I can on him. Lock of the night play, Magomed Ankalaev. I got him at minus 255. A lot of people might think that's too much chalk, but these are those those bankroll building spots, in my opinion. Not often that we're going to get a guy like Ankalaev of this caliber at these types of odds. There is one guy that I will legitimately say is a solid threat to Ankalaev that I wouldn't bet Ankalaev at minus 255 against, and that's Jamal Hill. That guy's fast, a lot of power in his hands, very lanky as well. That could cause Uncle Ive some issues. However, Uncle Ive could probably take him to the ground and grind him out in that aspect. But I'll only do it if I get a good enough number on Uncle Ive. Remember what I said in the middle part of this podcast? We're betting numbers, not fighters. All right, so Uncle Ive and you, I think he knocks out Blahovich later on in this matchup. I think we see Blahovich overextend on a strike. Uncle Ive take advantage of it and get him out of there. Probably later on in this matchup, but I do think that we see Uncle Ive get the knockout, get the win inside the distance, plus 100. Lock it up. Money line lock of the night. Inside the distance, probably a little bit of a bonus cherry on top. But Anu, it's going to be Anu no matter who wins, but Uncle Ive should get his hand raised here. Uncle Ive should win this fight. And it will be the start of the Magomed Uncle Ive era, which I promise you will last longer than the Leota Machida era. Shout out to anybody that remembers that reference. There you guys go. 13 fights, 14 fights, whatever it may be. UFC 282, put a bow on it. We have pr- broken down and predicted every single fight. Hopefully there's no late fight week changes or movements or anything like that. Wins wise, keep an eye on Alexander Hernandez. See how he looks down at 145 pounds. Make your judgments after that. Still picking Billy Q to win that fight. Even if he does have a good weight cut, I think Billy Q still drowns him and wins that fight. Remember, LFA breakdowns on the Patreon will be dropping over the next 12 to 24 hours. So keep your eyes peeled for that if you're on the Patreon. If you want to sign up to it, Link in the description below. All my bets are already posted there. The bets will drop to the public on Friday. So keep your eyes peeled for that if you don't want to go to the Patreon. But the least I ask of you guys, hit that like, hit that subscribe. Drop a comment if you want as well. Rag on me for picking against Patty the Batty if you want. I don't give a fuck. It's my channel. It's my opinions. My views. I'm trying to cash some tickets over here. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. I'll see you guys throughout the week for all the other content that I drop. But good luck on your bets. Peace.